Satipatthana, The Direct Path to Realization, which I'm sure some of you have read. But his interest couldn't stop even with that much, but he went on first in Sri Lanka. He had already studied Pali. When he went back to Germany, he started to study Buddhist Chinese. Then he went on to enroll in, it's like a postdoctoral program. They call it in Europe, habilitation, not rehabilitation, <laughs> not rehab, habilitation. It's like beyond the PhD at the University of Marburg. And there he studied, of course, continued with Buddhist Chinese, Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, and Tibetan. Did I miss any other? And then his habilitation, that was the kind of dissertation, came to be published fairly recently in two massive volumes called The Comparative Study of the Majjhima Nikaya. It's a study of the suttas from the Majjhima Nikaya with all of their parallels from other traditions, parallels preserved in Chinese translation, some in Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, some were in Buddhist Sanskrit, some in even Tibetan. And so if you really want to you know, get into the depths of the different traditions of these suttas, I mean, this is the authoritative volume. But we have to find where it's published in the U.S., or where it's available in the USA since it's published in Taiwan. But you can just look the title. It's a comparative study of the Majjhima Nikaya. And the name Analayo is A-N long A-L-A-Y-O. And he's also, in the last few years, published many scholarly articles for journals. But he's not only a very painstaking scholar, but also a very diligent meditator. And so when I'm speaking here, I'm feeling a little bit apprehensive. You know, he used to be, I used to think, oh, we have that young German monk sitting <laughs> back in candy. <laughs> he don't know nothing. <laughs> now I have to speak with fear and trembling. <laughs> but you're asking, so why are you speaking, Bhante? Why isn't he speaking? <laughs> I had asked, you see, I had asked him if he would like to speak, and he said that he's just coming from Germany, so he'll be tired, but he will join us for the, and, it, and he wanted to sort of relive the experience of being <laughs> a young monk sitting in the lecture hall and candy and listening to my class. But he will join us for the after lunch discussion. In fact, he will lead the discussion, so the discussion doesn't have to be confined to the sutta, but any Dharma questions you have in any language. <laughs> Did you get into Japanese yet? No? Yeah, you could take this, the, the microphone. Just want to thank you for introducing the Honorable Analyo. I probably not saying that correctly. No, that, that sounds, that was correct. So thank you both for your scholarship, your practice, and your publications, your translation, and also bringing all of this to the Puni lineage of Parabhadra to establish that aspect of the community. And perhaps later also, I find that that Mm. Yeah. Okay. Do you have an idea where this book is available, the distributor in the U.S.? Yet, if you give him the microphone. Yeah. 
Yorko. I see it's a process of Or maybe we... Oh, that's a way to do it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could have it for your private reading, but... Um, it's very boring. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to Bowie? Okay, anyway, we'll start the sutta. Oh. I always have to remember that my eyes <laughs> are deteriorating. <laughs> okay, this is going to be a very powerful sutta. Those of you who have read it know this is sutta number 75 in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Magandhya Sutta. And we begin on page... 607. And so this is a very powerful sutta. I'm a little bit afraid to teach it because I'm afraid if I teach, you know, the first part, then in next week's class, the number of students will be reduced 75%. <laughs> is that Buddhism? <laughs> I thought it was just about living happily in the here and now. But I think that this is, the sutta gives us a real important lesson, especially in this time of easy pleasure, easily available pleasure. Okay, so let us take a look at the sutta. Okay, the sutta begins, it said, when the Buddha is living in the Kuru country. That's pretty much the area of north central India, almost where Delhi is now, and that this town of the Kuru people named Kamasa Dhamma. And it said, he, this is the important part that leads into the actual discourse, that he was living on a spread of grass in the fire cha chamber of a Brahmin belonging to the Bharadvaja clan. Okay, so then one morning, the Buddha dressed and he went into the town on his alms round. And then after he collected his alms, then after his meal, he went to a certain grove to spend the day. And he sat down at the foot of a tree and started his daily meditation. And now the protagonist of this uh, sutta a wanderer named Magandhya had been walking around for exercise and then he comes to the fire chamber of the same Brahmin, Brahmin of the Bharadvaja clan. And he sees the spread of grass prepared and then he asks the Brahmin, who's staying on this grass mat in your fire chamber? For some reason, he's able to infer, it's a little puzzling. He says, it looks like it might be an ascetic's bed, a recluse's bed. Maybe he knows that wandering ascetics will often stay in somebody's extra chamber, and they maybe have a distinctive way of rolling out a mat or a stack of grass to make a bed, you know, rather than saying, oh, Bharadvaja, can you bring a very comfortable bed or mattress in. They just take some grass or hay and spread it out. And maybe he had some personal, the Buddha had some personal belongings that he would carry around with him that he left by the, by the mat. So Bhagandhya was pretty sharp-sighted, so he was able to draw this inference. And so then the Brahmin says, that there is now the ascetic named, or the recluse named Gotama, who comes from the Sakyan clan. And now he is staying at this bed of grass. 
and then this good report has gone has been spreading around about him. Then this is the standard verse of praise to the Buddha, that he's an arahat, fully enlightened, and so on. And so this grass spread has been prepared for Master Gotama. Okay, now when Magandhya hears the name of the ascetic Gotama, he's heard that name before, and he doesn't have such a good impression. He's probably never met the Buddha before in person, but for him, the Buddha has a bad reputation. And he says, <laughs> this is a little awkward. <laughs> okay, thank you. Careful, this stripping. It's okay, don't worry about it. Chifan, don't worry, it's okay now. Okay, so when Bagandia hears this, he says, it's an ill sight that we see when we see that, b that bed prepared for Master Gotama. Then he uses an expression here in Pali. It's a very unusual expression. Buddha. Was it Huna or Hana? Hanu. Hanu? Huna. No, the second part. Huna? Okay. This would be okay? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, now this translation is based on, you see, it was a very unusual expression. So this translation follows the commentary, which the commentary explains this as fadi hataka, which means literally like one who destroys growth. And then I looked up this expression, well, of course, in the Pali dictionaries, I found it there in the Pali English Dictionary. I looked for it in the Sanskrit English Dictionary, couldn't find it there. And I looked in the Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit Dictionary, couldn't find it there. So apparently it's not a commonly used expression. And what the commentary says, which is the basis for this translation, it's not completely satisfying to me. But I found a useful hint, of course, whenever I give these talks, <laughs> On any sutta, I always have to consult the authority to find out what parallels might say. So, in a way, Venable Analio has become my guide to the <laughs> varied, to the parallel versions to the Majjhima Nikaya. Yeah, I think it was B.C. Law who, in my opinion, B.C. Law and somebody named Saxena, it looks like. I have to bring my other pair of glasses to these classes in the future. I'm seeing everything as pretty much as a blur. But... These scholars, B.C. Law and this one Saxena, speculate that the original sense was the killer of embryos. In other words, one who produces abortions, an abortionist, you might say. Do you think that's a workable? Yeah, you know, we just have conjecture. But it seemed to have been a, a term that had a bad designation because when 
Magandhya says this, then the Brahmin says, be careful what you say, Magandhya, be careful what you say. Many learned Brahmin, learned nobles, Brahmins, householders, as well as other learned ascetics have complete confidence in this master Gotama, and then they've been trained by him in the noble path and this good, wholesome Dhamma. Then Magandhya, he seems to be a rather boastful person, so he says, you know, one of these, you're not going to deter me with that cheap, cheap shot Brahmin. So he says, Master Bharadvaja, even if I saw Master Gotama face to face, I would tell him right to his face, you are a Buna, Buna Huna. You're a, whether destroyer of growth or an abortionist. And then he says, why is that? Because that has come down in our discourse. Apparently, they wouldn't have had written scriptures, but apparently there was some kind of authoritative oral tradition which he had learned maybe from his teachers and his teachers and teachers which described this bad designation, this pejorative term to the one that we call the Buddha. And then Bharadvaja says, if you have no objection, may I tell <laughs> Master Gautama that? <laughs> And then Magandhya, again, he's very, a little bit arrogant, and so he says, I have no objection at all. You could tell him anything that you want. You could even say that to Master Gotama. You could tell him just what I said. But meanwhile, the Buddha has this special faculty of hearing that we call the divine ear, so that he could hear sounds and conversations going on at a distance. And so he heard this conversation taking place from his meditation seat beneath the tree in the grove where he was staying. So then in the evening or late afternoon, he got out from, he arose from his meditation and he came back to the fire chamber. He sits down on the spread of grass that's been prepared. And then the Brahmin comes to the Buddha and after exchanging greetings, the Buddha asked the Brahmin, he says, did you have some conversation with the wanderer Magandhya about the spread of grass? So the Buddha is trying to, you know, in an indirect way, open up that conversation. And then the Brahmin is awestruck, and it says his hair, hair the hairs of his body are standing on end, and he said, we want, I wanted to tell Master Gautama about that very same thing, but you already knew what took place. Okay, and then while they're speaking, the wanderer Magandhya, who maybe he was just hanging around outside the house, just waiting for the Buddha to return. <laughs> that's, that's my hypothesis. You know, so he, he was probably itching to start a fight with the Buddha, a debate. So when the Buddha, he knows that the Buddha is inside the fire chamber, he just kind of like nonchalantly comes strolling in, like he, does, you know, he doesn't really know what's happening, you know, putting on a pretense of this air of noble indifference. And, you know, like, well, what a surprise. <laughs> Look who's here. Okay, so he comes up to the Buddha, they exchange what said courteous and amiable talk. <laughs> okay, and then the Buddha starts the discourse to Magandhya. He says, Magandhya, he's going to bring out the implications that Magandhya had when he used the expression. So the Buddha says, the eye delights in forms, takes delight in forms, rejoices in forms. And that 
That is, the I has been tamed by the Tathagata, guarded, protected, and restrained, and he teaches the Dhamma for its restraint, the restraint of the I faculty. Was it reference to this, that you said that I'm a destroyer of growth or an abortionist? And then I would assume that actually in the real conversation the Buddha would have gone through all of the senses first. Or maybe he would have just expressed it concisely that the sense organs delight in their objects, but because the form of the discourse always spells out each individual sense faculty. But I would put Magandhya's answer at the end. So the Buddha will say, the eye delights in forms, the ear delights in sounds, the nose in odors, the tongue in flavors, the body in tangible sensations, the mind in mental objects, and so on. And the Tathagata has tamed and mastered all of this and he teaches the Dhamma for the restraint of the sense faculties. Was it with reference to this that you called me a destroyer of growth? And then Magandhya says, it was exactly with reference to that, Master Gotama, that I said, you are an abortionist, the destroyer of growth. For what reason? Because that's recorded in our scriptures even though they're not written scriptures, but in our textual tradition, we could say. And so we could see what the point of t disagreement is here between the Buddha and Magandhya. Even though Magandhya is described as a wanderer, and so we think of the wanderers in India of the, at the Buddha's time as being kind of ascetics, but it seems that Magandhya could have belonged to a community that believed in you know, you don't get tied down by the household, bearing children and having to work for a living and, you know, maintain, cultivate the land or work at a profession. But he might have belonged to a community of wanderers such as that described in an earlier sutta in Majjhima I think it's sutta number 45. This is on page 405. If you turn to that, the shorter discourse on ways of undertaking things. And then we come in paragraph three, section three. The Buddha is speaking about certain recluses and Brahmins who hold the doctrine and view. There is no harm in sensual pleasures. And then they take to gulping down sensual pleasures and divert themselves with women wanderers who wear their hair bound up in a top knot. <laughs> so these are kind of, maybe we would call them hedonists or sensualists, but they still outwardly, they live the life of wandering ascetics. They're not tied down with household responsibilities. And they even have their own doctrine about nirvana or nibbana, as we'll see. This is the view of nibbana, which is expressed in the Brahmajala Sutta, the first sutta in the Diga Nikaya, that when a person is fully supplied with all the pleasures of the senses and can freely indulge them, that, they say, is supreme nirvana in this present life. So it seems Magandhya might have been coming from that tradition. And so when he heard the you know, reports that this ascetic Gautama is going around saying, control the eye, control the ear, control the nose, control the senses, control the mind, he would have thought, wow, our American expression would be killjoy. Maybe that's what it is. The buna means what grows, not joy. But we would call it, in American English, a killjoy. He's really, you know, just a drag man. <laughs> you know, like a strict Sunday school teacher with a ruler who hits the students, 
don't talk in class, Johnny. You know, no, no pleasure, no fun. So that's his picture of the Buddha, you know, just one of these stern, grumpy, ascetic types. Okay, so now the Buddha is going to pick up on this and explore the thesis, the underlying view of Magandhya and his group. So he starts with, in his own way, with asking questions. He says, what do you think, Magandhya? Here someone might have formally enjoyed himself with forms cognizable by the eye, wish for, desired, agreeable and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. On a later occasion, have, having understood as they actually are the origin, the disappearance or passing away, the gratification, the danger, and the escape in the case of forms, he might abandon the craving for forms, remove the fever, that's the fever of passion, passionate desire for forms, and he'll dwell without thirst, with a mind inwardly at peace. What would you say to him, Magandhya? Like Magandhya is like pushed into a corner. You know, he's not this one who understands the nature of forms from these five important angles that they arise and pass away so they're impermanent. He understands that they give enjoyment, that's the gratification in them. He understands the danger or unsatisfactoriness in them. Probably the Buddha in the actual discourse, he would have elaborated on this, but the compilers can just, because they have other discourses to refer to, so to make it easy to transmit orally, they just compress it into one little formula. So the danger is that these forms and other sense objects are impermanent, not really deeply satisfying, and he knows the escape or release from bondage to these forms and other sense objects. And then the key word is that he's dwelling free from the fever for forms. You know, we, the Buddha here is depicting lust or passion as a kind of heated condition. And in India, it's not like in the West when in the winter we like to be warm. But in India, where it's usually warm, then an excess of warmth becomes like a feverous condition, which is unpleasant. And so then he abides without thirst, inwardly at peace. So when Magandhya is asked, what do you have to say to him? You're going to tell him, come on, man. We have some nice forms to enjoy. Enjoy them. So Magandhya re must realize that's only going to be stirring up more passion, more fever, more fire in this person whose mind is inwardly at peace. So what could he say? Nothing. Okay, the same thing is repeated for each of the other senses, including the mind objects. Yeah. Oh, gratification. In fact, that's a good question, though. We have these three, whoops, three terms that There's adinava. I'm sorry, for gratification is asada, which I think literally is connected with the idea of tasting something which is sweet. So some of the early translators, translators use the expression, their sweet taste. Then adinava is something like the misery or the unsatisfactoriness in these things. Then the sarana means the way out, the way that leads out.
And the way out is usually expressed as the removal of desire and passion. The abandoning and removal of desire and passion, desire and lust. Okay, so now first the Buddha began with this, call it an impersonal presentation, just speaking about somebody. But now the Buddha is going to speak directly from his own experience. So he says, Magandhya, and don't forget that the Buddha, you know, the story that he was the son of a king is no doubt a later sort of exaggeration, but he came from the aristocratic, because the Sakyan Latin, country was a republic, but the Buddha came from an aristocrat aristocratic family. So his father could have been like the senior member of the ruling council. So the Buddha had it pretty easy in his, uh, pre his pre-renunciation days. So he says, formerly when I lived the household life, I enjoyed myself provided and endowed with the five objects of sensual pleasure. That's for, delightful forms, sounds, odors, tastes, tactiles, and, well, just uh, tactiles. Then he said, I had three palaces, or three mansions, one for each of the seasons. In northern India, they have three seasons. There's the rainy season, which is usually from June, July, August, or July, August, September, October. Then after that comes the cool season, the pleasant season, which is usually like November, December, January, February. Then comes the, the end of February, it starts to get warm. Then comes the hot season, March, April, May, and June. So. You know, just like we have a heater in the winter, then when the summer comes, we turn off the heater and we put on the air conditioner. So the Buddha, because he was quite well off, he had separate buildings which were constructed differently. So the building for the hot season was probably much more spacious, more open, big windows so the air would come through. For the cold, for the winter, a cold season was probably more compressed, so to hold in the heat. And the rainy season, I don't know, it might have had something to dry up, the, to make things dry, I don't know what. And he said, during the three months of the, uh, four months of the rainy season, I lived in the rain's palace enjoying myself with musicians, none of whom <laughs> were men. <laughs> so it said that all of his musicians were women, and I did not, but was this all of whom, none of whom were men. I wonder if some of them could have been like eunuchs? I don't know. It seems a little strange expression rather than saying explicitly that they were all women. And I did not go down to the lower palace, the lower floor of the palace. He could just stay up on the second floor, or maybe even third floor, and people, his servants, would bring his meals to him. They, others would come and take away the plates and dishes. So he was really like living quite the life of an easy life. Okay, but now, he says, on a later occasion, having understood as they really are the origin, disappearance, gratification, danger, and escape, in the case of sensual pleasures, I abandon the craving for them, I remove the fever about them. And now, I myself dwell without thirst, with a mind inwardly at peace, Okay, so now the Buddha is the one who fulfills the, the previous example that he gave. So he's showing that he's talking about this from his own experience. 
And now he says, I see other beings or people who are not free from lust for sensual pleasures. Now this is where it gets pretty strong. Being devoured by the craving for sensual pleasures. Burning with the fever for sensual pleasures. Indulging in sensual pleasures. So, you know, we see on television or people see television, the movies, you know, the hero is living in the penthouse apartment. He has, you know, maybe three or four girlfriends. He comes down in Prius. You know, he's a little hip to the environmental crisis, so he uses a Prius. Not completely wasteful. He wants to show that he has, <laughs> that he's a green consumer. <laughs> Or maybe he likes a little red sports car and he has, you know, the finest wines and whiskeys on his, they have like a little inbuilt bar in his penthouse apartment. And, you know, people see this and they think, especially, I have to say, in Asia, you know, people see, wow, life in America. <laughs> wow. And they're living like, this is my experience. We used to go on arms round up this hill and we look in the distance and you see the beautiful hills in the distance, green fields. And imagine the people are living so simply and happily, contentedly. But then this comes on the television and <laughs> the movies. Can I get a ticket to America? <laughs> but you, you won't be living like that in America. You'll have to you know, work eight, ten hours a day living you know, in the city apartment and look at the beautiful view you have here. Quite, you, know, you only have to work a few hours a day during the growing season. You don't want to go to America, do you? Yeah, can you get me a ticket? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so people see that and, you know, they're envious. You know, that's why, like, Playboy magazine, it's so popular, because everybody is um, envying this, what's his name? Huge Hefner, is that the name? Excuse me? You Hefner who's now 83 years old and what, he has three girlfriends? <laughs> okay, but the Buddha says, I look out at these people and I do not envy them, nor do I delight in the kinds of pleasures that they're delighting in. So what is the reason? Now he says, like a really key statement. He says, there is Magandhya, a delight. I think he uses the word rati, if I remember, which in normal usage it signifies the delight of sense pleasures. But here the Buddha is using this in another sense. He says it's the delight apart from sensual pleasures, apart from unwholesome mental states or mental qualities, and which surpasses even divine bliss. You know, if we're not interested in sense pleasures, but even in the Buddhist time, many of the people who were living a religious life were doing so with the thought, you know, I give it up in this life, in the next life I sort of go to the karmic bank and I collect all of the funds that have been built up there <laughs> by getting to enjoy to be reborn in heaven, then I get the beautiful nymphs, or the women get the handsome young goddess. Uh, uh, the, the women get the handsome young god, the handsome young deity, and we get the delightful music. You know, all of the bliss of this um, celestial sense pleasures. But the Buddha here is speaking about a delight apart from sensual pleasures, even divine or heavenly sense pleasures. 
And since I take delight in that, I do not envy what is inferior. So the Buddha's here, he's sort of describing sense pleasures as inferior, and I don't take delight in them. And now what is this bliss, or I'm sorry, this super sensory delight that the Buddha is speaking about? I think the commentary explains this, if I remember, as Yeah, the commentary says that this is the attainment of the fruit of our hardship, the meditative attainment of the fruit of our, our hardship based on the fourth jhana. I'll write a very big, long expression. Arahata Pala Samapati, which means it's supposed to be a special meditative attainment or meditative state available to the Arhat in which he can go into this state and experience the bliss of Nibbana for as long as he predetermines. Whether this was the Buddha's actual intention, that uh, I don't know, because this description that's given here could even apply to the jhanas. But the the arahatapala samapati, these correspond to the jhanas, to the levels of the jhanas, but they have nibbana as their object rather than the ordinary object of jhana. But this could just be just the bliss of the jhanas. We don't know for certain. Okay, now the Buddha is going to start using some analogies in order to try to drive home the point more clearly to Magandhya. So he says, suppose we have a rich householder or young householder, the son of the householder who has all of the kinds of sense pleasures he might desire. And then he behaves well. He's a morally upright person. He behaves well with body, speech, and mind. And so when he dies, he takes rebirth in a happy realm in one of the heavenly worlds. And he makes, the Buddha mentions here, the Tavatingsa Devas, the gods of the heaven of the 33. It's one of the sense, sensory realm, heavenly worlds. And there he's surrounded by a group of nymphs in the Nandana Grove, enjoying himself with the five objects of divine or heavenly sense pleasure. So now he could look down at huge Hefner, and you know the way children, when they get a special privilege that the other child doesn't have, that their brother or sister doesn't have, they go like this, <laughs> well, like this. You know, so he's looking down at heaven, at huge Hefner, you know, huge Hefner sporting himself with his three girlfriends in the room with all of the mirrors. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> Okay, so he looks down, he sees a householder or householder's son enjoying himself, provided and endowed with the five objects of human sense pleasures. Okay, so what do you think? Would that newborn deity up there, enjoying the divine sense pleasures, envy the human householder who's enjoying the human sense pleasures? or would he want to leave the heavenly world and come down? No, he wouldn't, certainly not. And Magandhya gives the reason, he says, why not? Because divine or heavenly sense pleasures 
are more excellent, more sublime than the human sense pleasures. Okay, so then the Buddha repeats the same passage, the same statement that he made earlier, that he used, when he lived the home life, he was able to enjoy all of the types of sense pleasures, but now that he's, a, with, that he's abandoned them and has a mind inwardly at peace, when he sees other people enjoying the human sense pleasures, then he doesn't envy them or long to, um, to enjoy those types of pleasures. And so the reason is because he knows, he experiences a kind of delight apart from sense pleasures, which surpasses even divine bliss. Okay, before I get to go into the next section, does anybody have any questions on anything taken up so far? Just on the text itself, I don't want to go off into side issues because what's going to come is still in continuity with this. But just anything that's a little unclear. Katie? Oh, the word rati. Is it rati? Do you remember? Yeah, I think it was, yeah. Excuse me? Oops. Any, any other questions, comments? Okay, then we'll go on. Okay, and here I was quite interested to see in Venerable Analio's treatment of the sutta, comparing it with the version that's come down in the Madhyama Agama, that's a version of the, or the counterpart of the Majjhima Nikaya that has come down in the Chinese translation. I hope I didn't lose that. <laughs> that that version had the similes in a somewhat different order, and that got me thinking, and I came up with still another sequence that seems to me more, more reasonable. So I want, let's take, not the sequence that's come down here, but the way I would reorder the sequence. And I'll explain the reason for each step. We go from here to paragraph 17. The subject of the simile, of all the similes is the same up to the very end but the events are different. Okay, we start off with a leper or somebody with some kind of skin disease. I'm not sure if this is actual leprosy, but he has sores and blisters on his limbs and these sores are being, uh, this is, a, why I don't want you to run out, somebody lock the doors. <laughs> the sores of being devoured by worms, you know, the flies come and lay their eggs in there, and so the worms are crawling around. And the poor man, in order to get a little relief, he's scratching the wounds, and when he does so, he pulls the scabs off. And then he has a kind of charcoal grill in front of him, where he has to cauterize his body over a charcoal pit, seems when he heats up the wounds, then he gets some kind of pleasure from this. And it says that the more he scratches these scabs and cauterizes his body, the fouler, more evil smelling and more infected the openings of his wounds would become. So why is he doing this? because he would find a certain measure of satisfaction and enjoyment in scratching the wounds. Well, you don't have to have like leprosy or some other skin disease to know this. 
Like if you get a mosquito bite where it's really itching, you know, you know what happens when you it it when you scratch the mosquito bite. You know, when you're doing it, oh, what relief, what relief! Especially if you've been sitting in meditation, and then the mosquito bite starts. You get the that annoying sensation. You think, okay, I'll just scratch once, just one scratch, once. Can't resist. Two, three, four. Okay. <coughs> wow, nice. Then you stop. Okay, go back to my meditation. In, out. Ah, oh, that was such a relief. In, out, in, out. What? What's that? Starting again. In, out. Oh, increasing. Oh, terrible. I have to scratch again. Yeah, so it just starts increasing. So the more you scratch, the more it itches. But when you scratch, you get some satisfaction. And so then now the Buddha sort of pulls out the analogy or simile. And so those beings who are not free from lust for sense pleasures, who are devoured by the craving for sense pleasures, burn with the f who are burning with the fever for sense pleasures, indulge in sense pleasures, and the more they indulge, the more their craving increases, and the more they are burned by the fever of sensual, for sensual pleasures. Uh, whoops, got, let me just go back. The more their craving for sens sensual pleasures increases, and the more they are burned by their fever for sensual pleasures, yet they find a certain measure of satisfaction and enjoyment independence of the five objects of sense pleasures. Okay, so the reason I take this passage first, because this passage describes what I would call the plight of this poor man, his situation, which is analogous to the situation of human beings who are, this is the way human beings ordinarily live their lives, you know, constantly consumed by the craving for sense pleasures and we indulge, we get a momentary, or could be more than momentary, but we get a temporary satisfaction. Then we think, wow, that was nice relief. But then, you know, the next day, the next hour, the next week, whatever, the next year, if it's like a trip to a foreign country, but <laughs> that craving for sense pleasures comes back often stronger than before. So that is what I call the plight. Then I would go to paragraph thir or section 13, which shows us what I call the cure. See, that comes naturally after the plight. Okay, so the description go begins again with the man with the sores, cauterizing his wounds over the charcoal pit, then his friends and com companions bring a, phys <coughs> bring a doctor to cure him. And the physician makes a medicine for him. And by means of that medicine, the man is cured of his skin disease, leprosy or whatever. And now he's well and happy, independent, master of himself, able to go where he likes. See, that seems to come naturally after the description of the plight. Okay, thou, he sees another leper who has the sores and blisters, who, and there are the worms crawling around in the wounds, and he sees this poor man <clears throat> scratching his wounds with his nails and holding his body over the charcoal, burning charcoals, and now, is that leper who's been cured, is he going to think, wow, that man must be really enjoying himself, scratching the wounds and heating his body over the charcoal pit? And would he want to go back to his leprosy? You know, somebody says, I could inject you with a, a serum taken from that leper, and you'll get your leprosy again. And then you'll be able to scratch your wounds and to heat your body over the charcoal pit. He said, no, no dice, man, no thanks. Or maybe it's that thanks, but no thanks. I'm happy the way I am. 
So Bhagandiya says, okay, why is that? He says, because when there is sickness, there is need for medicine, and when there is no sickness, there is no need for medicine. So no need to take medicine to stop the itching, no need to heat the body up over the charcoal pit. Okay, so then the Buddha just fills in paragraph 14, drawing the parallel again. Okay, then next, and I call this section, number 13, I call this the minor chord. There's going to be like a minor chord and a major chord. The minor chord is that he has the simply has the opportunity to hold his, to scratch his body or to hold his body over the charcoal pit, and he just refuses it. Now, paragraph 15 is what I call the major chord. It's the stronger simile. So the Buddha begins again with the man who's devoured, who's has these sores and blisters on his limbs with the worms crawling inside, scratching them, burning or holding his limbs over the charcoal pit. Then his friends and relatives bring the physician to treat him. The physician treats him, and by means of that cure, that means of that treatment, the medicine, the man is cured of his leprosy, well and happy. And now, this is the strong point, two strong men grab him by both arms and drag him towards a burning charcoal pit. What's going to happen? Wouldn't that man start you know, twisting and turning and trying to break free? And Magandhya says, certainly, Master Gotama. Why is that? because that fire is indeed painful to touch, hot and scourging. Okay, now the Buddha is going to ask the sort of question, which is going to like, probably was going to blow open Magandhya's mind. He says, what do you think, Magandhya? Is it only now that that fire is painful to touch, hot and scorching, or was it also painful, hot and scorching previously, even when the man was holding his body over it? And now Magandhya, he's really locked, what's the expression? You know, when somebody is cornered, yeah, cornered, or almost like we say checkmated, but maybe he's not fully aware of how he's gotten cornered. He says, so he's asked the reason, so he says, Master Gotama, that fire is now painful, hot, and scorching, and previously, too, that fire was painful, hot, and scorching. For when that man was a leper, with the sores and blisters on his limbs, being devoured by worms, scratching the openings of the wounds, his faculties, this is a key phrase, his faculties were impaired, and thus, even though the fire was actually painful to touch, he acquired a mistaken perception of it as pleasant. Now, this is a phrase, I really have to believe that it's the compilers of the text who have used that phrase here, because it ties in with the key Buddhist concept, a key expression in the Buddhist text. So he uses the expression mistaken perception.
There's a key expression. Okay, well, the expression used in the text is viparita sanya. Viparita means something like, this is actually your Chinese tian dao. Is it tian dao or tian dao? Dao is fourth tone, right? And tian is what? First tone. Hold up the fingers. First tone. Tian dao. Okay. Which means literally like upside down. So this is an upside down perception. Perception of things opposite from the way they actually are. And then this ties up with the noun which is related to viparita, which is vipalasa, which means, we translate it as an inversion or distortion. Inversion is better because inversion implies just things, tur something turned upside down. So the texts, other suttas speak about the distortion inversion of perception in four ways, taking what is impermanent to be permanent, taking what is unpleasurable or painful to be pleasant, taking what is non-self to be self, and taking what is unattractive to be beautiful and attractive. So those are the four inversions of perception. And which of these four inversions is being referred to here? Well, it's perception, but of the four, perception regarding, right, exactly, taking what is really painful or, or subject to, or produce, productive of suffering, taking that to be a source of bliss or happiness. So he has that mistaken perception of it because his faculties are impaired, because he has the skin disease, so he's not able to feel the pain of the fire as pain, but that skin disease turns that pain around so he feels it as pleasant. But now the man has been cured of the disease, so he can feel the, f the pain of the fire well, he can feel the fire the way it really is, as painful. So now the Buddha draws out what I call the conclusion in paragraph 16. He says, So too, Magandhya, in the past, sensual pleasures were painful to touch, hot and scorching, so they will be in the future, and at present, they're painful to touch, hot and scorching. But those beings who are not free from lust for sensual pleasures, devoured by craving for sensual pleasures, who burn with the fever for sensual pleasures, have faculties that are impaired. And now the Buddha here, he's not referring to the bodily sense faculty, as in the case of the leper, but probably this will be the faculty of understanding their faculty is impaired. And so, and so, though sensual pleasures are actually painful to touch, they acquire a mistaken perception of them as pleasant. So it's because of this distortion of perception, and this comes basically because what would be the underlying roots of this distortion of perception, inversion of perception? Craving, and what would even lie more, a bit deeper than the craving? Exactly, ignorance, so it's ignorance at the deepest level and so through ignorance of the nature of things, not knowing the true nature of the sense objects, there comes the craving for them. And because the cr of the craving for them, we take, we perceive them as that can satisfy my craving. When I get that, I'll be happy. You know, just like in ordinary lives. You know, back when I was... <clears throat> I think high school senior or college student, 
Does Sam Goody's record store still exist in Manhattan? They folded. But I used to go there like, you know, a few times a month. You know, I would look at the records. At that time I liked ja both jazz and classical music. Then you would see a record, then go back home. Then, you know, suddenly, you know, in the midst of activity, the image of the record come, pops into the mind. Got to get that, the new John Coltrane record. <laughs> or that Mozart concerto, I didn't, don't have, I don't have that yet. And then, you know, through the week, the desire comes building up, building up. Then, you know, the weekend comes, first thing you're on the train going down to Sam Goody's, buy the record, take it home, wow, you know, leave it out on the table if you invite your friends over so they could see. Then um, playing it, oh, so interesting, so uplifting, so enjoyable. Then listen again and again and again. Till a couple of weeks later, you know, it's getting a little boring. I think I'll go down to Sam Goody's this afternoon, see if there's anything interesting there. Then there's a new, some new records have come out. They don't have it, gotta get it. Of course, that's a rather innocent example, but there are much more terrible examples than that. Okay, let's say, take any questions. Yeah, this is exactly. Yeah, it's good if you take, we have to adhere to this strict protocol regarding the microphone. Um, now, now you're getting the microphone, you speak through it. When you finish, you hold it. Whoever else has a question, we'll, you will give it to them. Okay, please. Okay, the time is running, so maybe you just speak loudly and I'll repeat, I'll repeat the question for the microphone, uh, for the recorder. Okay, you got it now. So, it's, um, it's diluted, this perception of the sense of pleasure. Yeah, see. yeah, it's the... Uh, not according to the reality. Exactly, that's what it is. Uh, yeah. So once you experience the reality, it's not the same as what you expect it to be. Well, usually normal people, when they <coughs> indulge, excuse me, <coughs> if they don't have the wisdom, their wisdom or insight starting to awaken, then when they in indulge the sense pleasures, they think, wow, this is really groovy, this is wonderful. So they, they yeah. kind of skip it and they don't reflect on it. Exactly, yeah. Of course, they, at, at a deep level, they'll be experiencing that discontent you know, but they don't really recognize that this is the kind of addictive, that's the good word, the addictive nature of sense pleasures, and that, call it the intrinsic unsatisfactoriness, that they're not really able to satisfy that deep yearning for a mind <clears throat> that's inwardly at peace and that can get access to this delight that transcends sensual pleasures. Somebody here? Okay, see you. Yeah. Arguments. I'm still wondering, so could we actually attain the final freedom? Do we first have to remove craving, or do we remove craving after we experience the final freedom? Okay, this is a good question. Uh, Maybe, <laughs> I don't know the answer. Anybody here know the answer? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you didn't hear it? He's... Okay. Let me repeat the question. He says, there seems to be a paradox here. He's saying, in fact, do we remove craving? How do you put it? Okay. 
Do we first have to remove craving in order to actually attain the final freedom, Nibbana? Or do we actually remove craving after we have already attained Nibbana, after seeing that there is something more peaceful? Yeah. Okay, but take the, take the microphone so we can have a clear recording of... Oh, that was no, that was good. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else have? Do you have another qu point? Okay. Take the microphone. I was going to say that um, before removing the craving, you get to develop wisdom, the insight to to see that first before you really you know, understand the process of uh, becoming origination. Ooh. Well, let's not go into dependent origination now, but um, I say first one starts like in gradual steps to separate oneself from the addiction to sense pleasures, even at a very early stage. For example, even when one takes a, the five precepts, one takes the precept to abstain from misconduct in sensual pleasures, which means sexual pleasures. So at least now one could still as a lay person, still enjoy sense pleasures, but certain limitations are being placed, not to tr uh, violate the bounds of normal decency. Then, from time to time, one might take eight precepts, observing celibacy for a day or two, or sometimes even taking it on a long-term basis. Then one will start you know, to be practicing meditation. One is dealing with the mind to separate the mind from sensual thoughts, sensual cravings. But then as one continues practice, then you will start to get insights which help to keep the, put the craving under control. And then, as Venable Nadio said, when you start making these breakthroughs, then the craving actually gets sliced away. Okay, we'll have time for one more question, one point, then we'll disperse for lunch and then come back after lunch. Yeah. There's a certain amount of, um, there can be at first a certain amount of pleasure or just sense consciousness happening there that's yeah. perhaps satisfying um, through the willing of hearing without even calling it anything. I'm trying to understand what um, both of the Buddha meant by Rati because to me, when the senses are taken out of heart without a, without a recognition of perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think these, what we might call just casual or adventitious sensory experiences are being referred to here. But he's ref he uses the you know, very clear, like, descriptive terms, like forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, likable, connected with sensual desires and provocative of lust. So these would be the really you know, stimulating objects of the senses. Yeah, almost always in this case, the feeling would be... Yeah, almost always the feeling would be pleasant. But it's the kind of pleasure that provokes sensual desire. 
but things like if you're you know, walking down the street and there's the sounds of cars passing by or the sight of, you know, you just pass houses, no special attraction to them, that's not really being taken into consideration here. Okay, we will stop now for the lunch and then we'll come back, we'll say give maybe 12, 10 or so. And we have, as I mentioned in the beginning, a very rare, <laughs> and you could ask any questions, you know, anything relating to Dharma, meditation, the German countryside, the weather, <laughs> no, anything related to Dharma, meditation, comparative Buddha studies, if anybody has been working, reading or studying in that field. And then I could just, you know, sit and learn a few things as well. It's nice when you could sit and listen to Dhamma rather than have to speak it all the time. Like last week I went to, they had the lecture, Sunday lecture at the library. Lusthaus, Dan Lusthaus, expert on Yogacara philosophy, and I was sitting there. I just realized, wow, I haven't done this in ages. Just sit and listen to somebody else speaking about Dhamma. <laughs> okay, we end with three short bows to the Buddha. Oh, I'm getting an F for mindfulness. We end with the sharing of the merits. <laughs> you cut that line off the recording, okay? edit it out. Okay, so we share the merits with the devas, nagas, bhutas, and so on. We'll do it the short way today. Akasata chabhumata deva naga mahitika punyantang anumoditva chirang rakantu sasanang akasata chabhumata Teva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anomoditva Chirang Rakantu Desanam Akasa Ta Chabumata Teva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anomoditva Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe deva no modantu, Sabe sampati sedia, Sabe buta no modantu, Sabe sampati sedia, Sabe satano modantu, Sabe sampati sedia, Pavago padaya vici hate to, Etantare satakayu papana, Rupi a rupi cha sanya sanino. Tu ka pumu chantu pusantu nibu ting. Okay, now we stand and do the three half bows to close. And also, I also want to mention that Baus, the Buddhist Association, prints a book of short essays by Venerable Analio for free distribution. It should be, there should be copies in the, you know, the books table in the big Buddha hall. So please just feel welcome. It's called, this one's called From Grasping to Emptiness, is that right? There was an earlier one that seems to have been distributed out. So everybody can take th their short essays about many topics relating to Dhamma. They're scholarly, of course they were done for the Encyclopedia of Buddhism, but they're always very clear, very erudite, very precise, meticulous. Thank you.